All right, I'm good. Going to go ahead and get started as we come in. Um, so good evening, everyone. My name is Karen Lewis, Executive Director here at Neighborhood Music School in Boyle Heights in Los Angeles. And I am so thrilled and honored to welcome you to our third installment of our Careers in Music series, Conductors. Now this series began as a collaboration with our friends at Disney Music Group Concert Division to explore all of the powerful ways in which music inspires and influences and generates pathways in all aspects of our lives and our careers and our environments. Now tonight we'll be focusing on the conductors um, and we'll be meeting three established and amazing artists who embody the heart of conducting with their artistry, their collaboration, and their leadership. So I'd like to thank and welcome our panelists, Susie, Enrico, and Sarah, and our moderator extraordinaire, Brannon, who um, we'll be taking over in just a couple minutes here. Um, and I'd like to also thank all of our families, near and far, who have joined the conversation today. Thank you for being here. Um, so we get to the question and answer session at the end. Um, many of you sent in some really great questions and thank you so much. You'll hear some of those in our presentation tonight. And if you didn't send some in, it's not too late. Please use the chat function and incorporate your questions there. And we will make sure that they are incorporated into the evening itself. So let's see, is there anything else? Um, I think that's it. So I think I'm going to turn this over to Brandon and our panelists, and I'm going to put myself on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. Hello, everybody. We're really excited to be here for the third installment of this. It's hard to believe we're on our number three. Um, really quite amazing. Tonight, I've got a couple really great, wonderful, amazing human beings to share with you all. I've had the privilege of not only these calling these people my friends, but also my colleagues getting to work with them both at Disney and in my professional life before this. So, and my name is Brandon, by the way, I am the Director of Concert Program Development and Operations for Disney Concerts, which ultimately means I get to have a lot of fun listening to Disney music a lot of days, looking at music and making amazing concerts that orchestras and other so ensembles get to perform and amazing families that like you all get to go hear and listen to. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our guest to you tonight. Uh, so for our conductor panelist, um, if you could briefly tell us where you're from or where you grew up, or in some cases, if you were born somewhere very interesting, I know some of you do have been, that would be great for our, peop for our friends here. And as well as, uh, where you live today, where you're based out of. So I think Enrico, if you will kick us off really quick. Sure, uh, my name is Enrico Lopez Yanez. I currently live in Nashville, Tennessee, home of country music. And uh, I was born in the United States in Virginia, though at the time our family was living in Germany uh, for my dad's work. So I was born and then quickly went back to Germany and then grew up mostly in California in the San Diego and LA areas. Very good. Uh, Sarah, you're next. Hey, I'm Sarah Hicks. Uh, nice to meet everyone. I was uh, born in Japan. My mom is Japanese. I moved to Hawaii when I was two, grew up there in that paradise. Uh, and now I feel like I live on an airplane um, on United. That's sort of my home, but I'm based in San Francisco um, in the Bay Area and I love it here. Wonderful. And certainly last but not least, uh, Susie. Hi, I'm Susie Benchisel Sider. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, um, and I reside now in Los Angeles, um, where in addition to the conducting, I also work in uh, film and TV as an orchestrator and a composer. Um, so I'm sort of more settled into LA and traveling a little bit less um, than probably my, my uh, colleagues. Awesome. And for our friends out there, we'll get into a little bit later, but it's quite possible that Susie has worked on a project that you all love and listen to on multiple times a day, some cases. So a <laughs> little fun fact there. Um, before we go on from introductions, Sarah, I happen to know that you have you have a very special travel companion and conducting assistant. Uh, I do have is, a... Are they, is he around? And he actually is around. Uh... <laughs> 
Pinkerton. He's the most famous dog amongst North American orchestras. His name is Pinkerton. And uh, he's my travel buddy. He's like, I was napping. Why'd you wake me up? But here he is. Hi. <laughs> it's true. I can vouch. I have personally met him on the road uh, in Minnesota. It was quite fun. So does anybody else have a travel buddy? Or Enrico, Susie, do you have anything quite that exciting? Um, every now and then, if it's if it's uh, close and if it's a very kid-friendly show, I'll bring, because I have, I have two kids. So I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old. Um, so I just recently was in San Diego conducting Muppets in Frozen. And so it was just a very appropriate show um, because we both just sing Frozen all the time. And so it was really nice to bring my four-year-old um, to the show and he got to sit in the audience and watch everything. And, and um, he also complains a lot less when I have to practice and um, sort of ignore him. <laughs> So now he knows what I what I really do and and can understand it much more, which is really nice. Always great when you get to share the experience with your family members, your friends, most certainly. So to kind of launch us off, um, I want to go through a really quick kind of rapid fire with with the three of you. And so I'll ask a question and I think we'll just kind of go right down in the same order with the answers. Uh, so we'll do Enrico, Sarah, and Susie, just kind of in, in answer to each of these questions, and we'll kind of just go through some basics to further introduce you to uh, all of our friends out here. So our first rapid fire question, what, what is, <laughs> was music a part of your family growing up? Enrico? Uh, yeah, for me, it was definitely both of my parents are musicians. My dad's an opera singer, and my mom is a pianist. So growing up, we used to travel with my dad around the world, wherever he'd be singing. And for me, sort of the opera house was my daycare. I mean, that's where I got to hang out. I got to play with costumes and prop swords and things like that. And that was my sort of first introduction to music was opera and definitely the way in which I got into it. And my mom used to have a children's music group with my sister and I, where we would go in the summers and sing at county fairs and do other goofy things like that. So it was always a part of my upbringing. Awesome. Next in line, Sarah. Uh, not so much professionally. Um, my mom is a classical Japanese dancer and my dad played the organ and piano just for fun. So there was always music in our household. They both love music. And I started the piano when I was four and was composing when I was five. So I started creating music, a lot of music in the house, probably more than my parents ever imagined or wanted. I like some of the, some of the kids out here listening, I'm sure here tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, and Susie, how about you? My dad uh, was is a surgeon, um, and my mom was a stay at home mom. So she was able to take me to all the dance and music lessons that um, I had any interest in. So I did get started with music uh, really early on. But personality wise, I'm definitely like my dad as a surgeon. So I kind of jump in and and do things, especially with film and TV. Um, so both of those sides have really influenced me a lot. Very good. So our second one, this should be a quick question for most of you. Uh, what was the first instrument that you played, Enrico? So I started on piano before anything else. My mom was my first teacher teaching me piano, which didn't last very long because, you know, having your mom as your teacher doesn't always go very well. <laughs> <laughs> Then you, what did you study in school then? What was your- In school, I moved on to play trumpet was my main instrument after that. Um, and then I played other things like drums and rock bands and things like that growing up. But trumpet was the one that I really focused on and studied. Very good. Uh, Sarah? Started with piano. I picked up the viola when I was 10 or 11. And uh, I actually went to university for composition before I went on to conducting. So a little bit of everything. I also sang in a punk band um, I was, I, I screamed a lot, so I don't know if I'd call it singing. <laughs> <laughs> and Susie, how about you? I was primarily a singer. Um, I played piano somewhat horribly um, and really can't play very well in front of people. Um, but I sing still um, and I sing on, I sing on films as well. So um, I've, I've kept up with that. And then I just through my education, I took up violin um, and then a little bit of bassoon. Excellent. 
So do any of you still perform as musicians? Susie, I said, you know, you just said you happen to still sing every once in a while professionally on some recordings. Um, Rico and Sarah, do you still, either you still play professionally at all? Very occasionally when I really have to. Uh, occasionally I'll do like a recording session or recently I have a show that goes out called Latin Fire. And during one of the pieces I did write a second trumpet part that I do pick up and play on stage. So it's not common, but occasionally I do. <laughs> uh, I still occasionally play the piano when I'm doing concerts in which uh, I'm describing music or we're using some historical context and I'll play an example, but not very much, not very much at all. <laughs> yeah, and then that's there for, I always literally am right at my desk and then singing too. So that's pretty common. I can say I don't I don't ever play professionally. I studied percussion all through school and then piano as well, but uh, I do not play professionally either anymore, but I certainly use it a lot in my day in my daily work putting together our shows, which is quite fun and helpful. So as far as conducting goes, when did you know that you wanted to become a conductor? Um, Enrico? Uh, I would say it was pretty late. I went into school thinking I was going to be a trumpet player and I did my undergraduate degree in trumpet. And then it wasn't until I was there, even though I had done a little bit of conducting before that I started to think about actually pursuing conducting. Um, and it was sort of towards the end of my undergraduate when it was already too late to really be applying to grad school for conducting. So I stayed on and I did a master's degree in trumpet before moving on to actually study conducting. Um, and even at that point, I still wasn't sure exactly what in conducting I wanted to do. I thought, oh, maybe I'll be an opera conductor and, uh, you know, follow in kind of my dad's footsteps without the need to actually be able to sing like he did. And it was sort of a windy path, but, but fairly late for me. Uh, Sarah? I started early, I guess, when I was 17. I wanted to be a pianist uh, growing up, and I started working semi-professionally as a pianist. Uh, I injured both of my hands. Um, they're very small, and you can't stretch them that much. So uh, I was crying in my room, and my dad said, you can still hold a stick, and that was the first day I conducted. I was 17, and I thought, I could do this. And from that point forward, I was pursuing all the possible ways I could make it a profession. Wow, that's a that's a story right there. I like it. <laughs> uh, Susie, how about you? I started taking conducting lessons in undergrad uh, when I was 19 um, and was always involved in it. And then after college, I uh, taught for six years at a boarding school in upstate New York. So I was conducting, um, you know, jazz ensemble, choir and things like that, like four times a day. Um, and happened to, very coincidentally, um, I taught Alan Menken's daughter, and that's what started me in this business, was I met him in um, the cafeteria of school when he was dropping off his daughter, and I said, hey, I'm interested in film music, and he said, give me a call, and so he became a mentor of mine for a number of years, um, so it was, you know, uh, really very lucky. Um, but then, you know, mostly I was orchestrating uh, film and it makes sense for me to conduct it because I'm already orchestrating it. Um, that's sort so I'm sort of secondary, or at least I began secondary as a conductor and I was mainly an orchestrator and it made sense for me to conduct. Very good. Susie, um, could you tell our audience, so Alan Menken is a very famous composer, especially in this little circle we're talking about. What are some of the films that some of our friends might know that Mr. Mankin has composed over the years? <laughs> he started with, uh, well, his first uh, Oscar was um, The Little Mermaid and he did Aladdin, um, my, one of my favorites, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, Enchanted and, and countless others. He's won eight Academy Awards and he is a legend and just a very, very nice person too. Disney royalty. Uh, yeah. He's a he's a true Disney legend and a an icon and uh, for a lot of us, I, I certainly believe. So that's an amazing story, Susie. It sounds like I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so a quick question here. This actually comes from Catherine. Who amongst you has performed at Walt Disney Concert Hall or the Hollywood Bowl? Uh, Enrico, have you performed at 
either venue? I'm not. Those are on my bucket list, but not yet. Hopefully one day. <laughs> my sister uh, has, and she always throws that in my face that she beat me. <laughs> okay, thanks. Of, of course. <laughs> of course she would, right? Sarah, how about you? Have you... Uh, uh, Walt Disney, I've done two or three times and Hollywood Bowl, I was thinking about it, six or seven, I think, through the what year. Was the last, what was the last project that you did there? That's I, the last thing I did was uh, <laughs> the summer of 2019, I did Harry Potter 6, I believe. Yes. No, no, that's not true. It was Coco at the Bowl. There you go. <laughs> sorry, there sorry, you go. sorry. November. <laughs> November. I the answer to that. I'm like, you were at Coco. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. I saw the I saw the special, the TV special. Right. <laughs> it was so great. Friends, if Thanks. you happen to had gone to Coco at the Hollywood Bowl back in 2019, Miss Hicks was conducting the orchestra for that show. And if you watch the special on Disney Plus about the live Coco performance that happened, you will see her forever in film having done that show with us. It was quite fun. Uh, Susie, how about you? Hollywood Bowl, uh, Walt Disney Concert Hall? Hollywood Bowl is my um, goal. Uh, Disney Hall, I'm not really, I don't really um, do appropriate music for Disney Hall. I kind of do just the film the film music thing. So it's not really a, something that gets performed at Disney Hall. I have done the Greek theater a number of times um, and the Microsoft theater, because uh, those are mainly sort of performative shows with picture. Very cool. So I think we're gonna move on to the next, kind of our next part about this, uh, this evening. So in your own words, um, panelist, if you could each tell us what is a conductor? Um, and the tricky part is whoever goes last will be the hardest part. So try not to copy off each other too much, but if, in your own words, um, tell the students here what it means to be a conductor. So I think we'll, we'll flip things around this time. And Sarah, if you want to go first for us. Sure. Uh, for me, a conductor is the person who has all the information that everyone else in the ensemble has individually. So I have to create the larger vision and find a way to communicate that to a lot of people in an efficient, mostly physical, sometimes with words, but a physical way, and then collect everyone's energy and create something beautiful through me that goes to the audience. So I feel like a vessel a vessel that has a lot of information from me. <laughs> That's a great answer. Uh, Susie, you are next. Uh, I feel like a conductor um, is the person that's trying to interpret what the composer intended, whether they're alive or dead, or if they've been dead for a hundred years, I have to really think about what they originally intended um, and try to interpret that and show that to the musicians that have all come together. Um, but I also feel like um, there's an element of constantly trying to um, lead, uh, you know, 80 people with different personalities and needs and, and wants and desires and trying to unify that. So I think it's more, it's also a unifier. Yeah, I think you raise a very good point there music making is very much about the human experience being human and bringing all those people together to create one piece of art together um, is quite an achievement um, and definitely needs some leadership to help get it there because 80 people equals 80 opinions <laughs> uh and enrico um what are your thoughts uh to me a conductor's main one of their main jobs is to inspire the people in front of them both on stage playing and the people behind the conductor in the audience uh, and our job is to help you know bring together 80 people who on their own can create beautiful music but no one of them can create what all of us together can create and it's our job to help inspire the best performance and the best you know efforts of all of the individuals who are there so that hopefully everyone that is on stage and in the audience has the best musical experience and leaves fully engaged and entertained and just with big smiles or tears or whatever it may be at the end of our concert. Sarah was our conductor for that. It's a very awesome project. 
so we've talked a little bit a little about what a conductor is. So I think one of the very interesting things about particularly in the music world is how people get their jobs. How do people become a conductor? How do they become a musician? So Enrico, uh, I was fortunate enough, we crossed paths earlier on in both of our careers. Um, I was part of the process of you actually getting one of your very first conducting jobs, um, professional ones, and you were quite an amazing conductor, I have to say. Um, between, obviously it involves a lot of practice, just like it is to be a musician, you know, and studying music and arm movements, breathing and focus and all these sorts of things that you apply from your study of your instrument and then into conducting. Um, but we received a question from one of the students from Gabriel, how do you actually get a job as a conductor? How does that happen? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, you know, a lot of people get conducting jobs different ways, depending on what your background in music is. Um, I'd say the way I did it was maybe one of the more traditional ways, which is applying to hundreds and hundreds of jobs and getting rejected hundreds and hundreds of times from those jobs, and then eventually getting lucky enough to be invited to uh, an audition at an orchestra. So much like if you play an instrument and if you want to be a part of a symphony orchestra on violin or trumpet, you would apply to those different orchestras and they hold auditions where they invite people to come. Usually it can be 200 or 300 people that apply to these jobs and you're then sort of whittled down based on either video that you send in or your resume and you get hopefully invited to sort of participate in one of these auditions. So for me, I had to fly out to Omaha for my audition. There was a nightmare of a story that was uh, my getting there, but I'll skip that, that's not important. Uh, the actual audition though is many different steps. Part of it is obviously conducting an orchestra. So you get up in front of the orchestra and you're assigned certain music that you have to conduct them in. There's usually an interview portion too, where you have several musicians and people from the orchestra staff who interview you. Sometimes they'll ask you to give, you know, sample programs and like pitch them on an education concert that you would want to conduct if you were a conductor there. And so it's multi steps, um, but all of them are geared towards the kind of work that you would be doing if you got hired at that job. Very interesting, absolutely. And that actually brings up a really good point that I want a question I wanted to ask the three of you, two really good things actually. Um, so in addition to standing out in front of an orchestra and waving your arms and smiling and doing all those amazing things and helping the musicians through a piece of music and helping them kind of craft what the composer's vision was, um, particularly now in 2022, Conductors mean a lot more to an orchestra than just a person that stands on a podium with a stick in their hand. Um, they're about being somebody that families and students like everyone here can really look to as a leader and a face of that organization and help really help them connect to that organization in a really meaningful way other than this, this group of people that's playing Beethoven's Fifth Symphony for the hundredth time <laughs> in the world or, or whatever it might be. Um, so we'll kind of go through the panel here, but could you tell us a little about a bit about what it means to be a conductor um, in 2022 and kind of going beyond the, the obvious things and what that means to you and bringing to the table? Um, I think Susie, if you want to start us off, that would be great. Sure. Um, I, I don't conduct Beethoven. Uh, it's not really my thing. Um, I am trained in film. Um, so I work in, in, on film projects. Um, for me, it's taken a different uh, turn because I am a parent now. And so I can really relate to the parents and the audience that are probably a little nervous to bring their children to a concert and see if they're settled in or if they're going to run away. And, you know, I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old and life is crazy. You know, after 530, you know, you may have a child that busts in here. Um, and so my sort of, I think, unique ability is to be able to relate to the parents. Um, and I, so I often do um, just say something uh, about, you know, how I'm also a parent and I, um, you know, bring my child to a concert. And that, I think, at least puts some of the parents at ease. Um, 
because that's a lot of the audience. And I do speak to the kids too um, and sort of engage them and they love that. Um, sometimes I think uh, in Pixar, we do a scream uh, to sort of introduce monsters because screams help the monsters. And so I invite all the kids to energize the, the orchestra by screaming and they love that. Um, and it kind of gets the energy out right in the middle of the, of the um, show. That's awesome. I love that so much. Screams do, they power the city. They really do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's even more powerful is laughter. <laughs> uh, Sarah, how about you? What are your thoughts on a conductor in 2022 and what that means? Sure. I mean, a conductor needs to advocate for the organization that they're working for and to be the face of it, but also to advocate for the community that the ensemble or orchestra serves to be willing and able to relate to lots of different communities, lots of different people to bring musicians into those communities rather than asking people to come to the concert hall because we need to be really an integrated part of the city that we work in, of the, the county, the state that we work in, um, and to really establish those relationships that are reciprocal and where we share ideas, where we share music, um, do things like in Minnesota where I do some work, we're creating a database of composers who have not uh, historically been ignored by pop composers and to try to expand our repertoire um, and to really be a leading cultural force. For many cities, the orchestra is one of the largest arts organizations. And so we have an incredible responsibility, not just to be a curatorial force and, and do Beethoven, which I do and I love it, but to be able to present new music to be able to connect with various parts of the community to be educational as well as entertaining. Um, and I love doing all of that because for me, it's about creating community around art and music. Um, as, as in film concerts, I think one of the really exciting things is those concerts really break down the barriers between the audience and the orchestra. I think it's one of the most exciting things when you're sitting there and the film happens, something happens in the film and the orchestra hits a moment when, you know, and when the Death Star explodes mm -hmm. and the audience just goes wild and they go crazy. Um, I think it's a really, it's one of those ways where it breaks through the barrier and it's so, it's so great to see the orchestra, the audience connect with the orchestra in those moments that are just organic and they happen right there in the room. So um, yeah, exactly. Uh, Enrico, what are your thoughts on a conductor in 2022? Yeah. I I completely agree with Sarah. I think for orchestras, the biggest thing about us is to really find ways to serve our community, to be a part of the city in an important way. And that means for me that I conduct, like Sarah, everything from Beethoven to movies to working with pop stars or rappers or rock stars, it doesn't matter. Like. I go around every day. If I take an Uber, if I order food at a restaurant, if I, you know, one of the first things I do is like, Hey, have you ever been to the symphony? No. What kind of music do you like? What are some of the things that you would like to see us do? What are I, so everywhere I go, I'm asking people constantly, what kind of music do you want to hear? What kind of guest artists do you want us to bring in? Because, you know, now with the internet, you can watch the Berlin Philharmonic or the New York Philharmonic on YouTube all you want. And you can hear the pieces that have been recorded like Beethoven a million times by these great orchestras, but what's going to make you really excited to come see the Nashville Symphony or, you know, the LA Philharmonic or the stuff that they can do that's unique in that community that's of interest to you. So I think the most important thing for a conductor is to be listening to the community and the people that live in that city and find out what they want to see uh, where maybe they want to see it because it's not always at the concert hall. Sometimes it's they want to see something outdoors at a parks concert or they want it in their community at a local shopping mall or somewhere else that would be easier for them to get to. And for me, that's part of a conductor's role is to listen and figure out how to make those things possible and make those things happen. Very good. And you raise a very good point. You know, a big part about conducting obviously is leading, but a big part about it too is, is listening. It's listening to your ensemble. It's listening to your community that surrounds you. Right. Um, as with any good, you know, position, you you listen. Um, so very good point. Um, 
it brings another very interesting question that people may or may not realize. Uh, when you are a conductor, do you get to pick what the orchestra performs or is it sometimes here's just this program and you have to have to perform that? Um, Sarah, what do your, how does that typically work for people? Um, pull back the curtain a little bit on programs. It really depends. Uh, often an orchestra will call me and say, we're doing Little Mermaid, and that's the end of the discussion. Sometimes they say, hey, we'd love to craft an uh, evening around uh, movie music about superheroes, and then I get to choose something. Or sometimes an orchestra calls and says, says we want to play the Amy Beach Gaelic Symphony. What else can we program with that. So it really depends on what the situation is. If you work regularly for an orchestra, it's more likely that you'll be able to choose. But I often am brought on and everything is set and I need to learn new music and show up and do it well. Interesting. So so it's not always what you want to do. Sometimes it's, you know, take it or leave it. Um, yeah. Or just take it. <laughs> or just take it. Just say yes, right? <laughs> As one of my colleagues like to say, just get on the bus. We'll come yeah. with us. It'll be great. Um, so I think this will this really takes us off into a really great another part that I want to kind of really specialize for each of you a little bit. Um, so each of you have do amazing work in very different and special ways. Um, so we're going to kind of dive into that here. And Rico, um, I'll start with you. And I think this would be a nice compliment to the question we just had Sarah is how is you put together programs and things like that. Um, tell us about how you have kind of brought into the work that you do, um, your Hispanic heritage, as well as a lot of the work that you do creating uh, family programs and education programs and community engagement programs. Sure. Um, well, for me, I mean, obviously my family and upbringing are very important. My dad was born and raised in Mexico and he moved here uh, to study opera when he was in college, but he had never learned English. He had, you know, just basic English in school and grew up here. And so his music was a big part of my upbringing, not just opera, but listening to mariachi music or listening to cumbias or other, you know, genres of Latin American music. Um, and so now that's something that I grew up with too. I played in mariachi groups when I was young. Those different uh, groups as well. And it's something that I think is still a genre of music that's loved by many, many people. So, you know, nowadays I get to collaborate. I sometimes I get commissioned to write arrangements for mariachi and orchestra, and we put programs like that together for the community. Uh, other times it's like Sarah mentioned, you get brought on to do something. Uh, the, one of the great mariachi legends, uh, Aida Cuevas, is, I'm doing a concert with her in Dallas next season uh, to do all of her music. And from an early age, I really loved you know, family and education programming too, as its own thing. I mentioned that I grew up singing in a children's group with my mom and sister. So we were always doing sort of kids programs. And actually, Brandon, when I worked with you in Omaha, that sort of was the first eye-opening experience of like what a family and education program can really look like. You know, I had sort of seen the traditional old fashioned like Leonard Bernstein, you know, someone talks at you from the stage sort of model. And in Omaha, it was completely flipped. It was all about the theatricality of it and being engaged and having the audience be involved. So uh, one of our coworkers, uh, Jess Slace and I started a company where we did that. I mean, we started producing shows that were highly theatrical for both the conductor and actors on stage where I dress up in costumes. Sometimes there's screen and there's video elements as a part of these shows. Um, but it's all about sort of bringing our music to the next generation, uh, this more interactive, more like being in a movie theater slash a Broadway show slash all of these other forms all at once uh, as a way to show people that, you know, classical and symphonic music are still very exciting and very powerful and fun uh, ways to be entertained. And it's just about making that accessible to people based on their current expectations of what is entertaining or not. Very cool. Um, it segues perfectly. It's like a plan that way. Um, Sarah, you are well known for conducting and doing programs of so many different varieties and genres. Uh, you will go from doing a classical show 
to a rap show with Dessa, to doing pop, more popular programming with people like Sting and Jennifer Hudson, to doing Coco at the Hollywood Bowl. <laughs> Did you kind of set out with this intent that, oh, I want to go conduct and be known for working for all these styles of programming? Or is it kind of something that you stumbled upon and just kind of happened? Um, tell us just a little bit about, about that and your experience doing that. Sure. I was trained as a classical conductor. So for the first five years of my career, that's what I pursued. And that's all the music I did. Um, in 2005, I did a show with this great group called Pink Martini. If you've never heard them, go and listen to them. And I realized there was a whole way of creating music, not just with classical musicians, but with all kinds of musicians. And I listened to all kinds of music and I wanted to work with all kinds of musicians. So I made a very conscious decision to pursue other things. Um, I was a very early adopter of the uh, life to film uh, genre as well. And I love doing that. And I love collaborating with different artists. And I still love the the classical stuff as well. So I guess I didn't stumble as a very conscious choice because I think the more things you do, the more you're engaged. And I like to keep learning and growing. And I really have in the 20 some odd years I've been working. Speaking of learning and growing, um, the, the past two years during the pandemic has been very interesting for all of us. Um, part, whether we're working in office, we're conductors, it's been very interesting. Um, you've done a lot of things over the past two years to really kind of grow yourself in a, as professional. Um, do you want to tell the kids a little bit about some of the fun things you've done over the past two years to keep making music and keep it at the forefront of people while we were trapped at home? <laughs> sure. Um, as orchestras couldn't play for audiences, they started live streaming and broadcasting. I became a broadcast host. Uh, I learned a whole new set of skills. I was nominated for a regional Emmy, which is kind of strange, um, and really got into that as a way of bringing music to people. I started a YouTube channel. I started uh, really doing more of the, the teaching element of what I do and demystifying conducting. I very much into music and mental health, um, started blogging about that and developing programs um, in which we use music as a focal point for meditation rather than as a background. So really branching out into what it means to be a musician and how you can use music to really impact, have a positive impact on the world. That's amazing. Very cool. And then Susie, I think this is going to really perk the ears up of a lot of our listeners here. Um, you mentioned earlier that you do some orchestrating and conducting work out in Hollywood for video games, for TV series, for movies. So if I, just a moment, just a really quick talk about some amazing things that you've done for the kids um, to kind of put it in perspective for them. You've been on some symphony tours for Legend of Zelda, for Pokemon. I'm sure some of you have heard of that small thing. And as well, you've worked on the music preparation orchestrating teams for some small films like The Minions, um, perhaps Encanto. I don't know if anybody's heard about that little film um, or heard about Bruno, but we don't really talk about him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> could you tell, tell the kids just a, about that work that you do, um, what it means to be an orchestrator and just your experience getting to work on those really exciting projects? It's funny because um, what Sarah and Enrique also do is the film, the, the live to film. And so I'm sort of also behind the scenes developing those because the music, um, there's, I call it forensic orchestration because the music is not, um, you know, when it was recorded, there's so many steps that happen between the time it records and then the time it actually needs to be this finished, you know, beautiful concert. And so I am the, the bridge to that. Um, and I'm part of a team. I am not, I don't work alone. I'm part of the Disney music uh, group, um, uh, music preparation department that works on that. Um, and so we take things like scores, handwritten things or um, something that's written on a computer and we have to figure out what, how to make sense of all of it into making it a full score 
um, that is, you know, relatively mistake free <laughs> and and then copied so that each individual player can play it. Um, I worked on Encanto um, most of last summer. Um, and musicals take a lot of work uh, because we had the score and the songs to work on. Um, so a lot of it is taking the computer music, which is the music was written by a composer or, or several composers and recorded and things like that. And then, and then making sense of it so that it can get recorded uh, by an orchestra. And then there's going to be changes because the film will change constantly as well. And so we need to make sure that the music now fits that film. And so there's just constant changes that go with it. Um, and then it's usually a photo finish mm -hmm. at the very end. Um, you know, so there is a, a wonderful team that I work with at Disney um, where there's 20 of us that, you know, are up very late at night and early in the morning working on that. And sometimes it'll be so close, you will literally work on a piece of music and it'll go right to a music stand to get recorded that we're all going to listen to on soundtracks for the rest of our lives. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. It is It is often a photo finish where things need to go. And the funny thing is my boss, Booker White, is, is very um, calm and collected all the time. And so it's sometimes hard for me to understand that there's a panic on the stage where he's like, so this needs to get recorded in 20 minutes. So go ahead. <laughs> and then we all just kind of panic and and work really fast. Um, part of being in film is is not only making it good, but making it on time and fast. Um, because there are so many artists that can make brilliant, brilliant music, but if it's not on time, it's never going to go anywhere. And so we're big people with um, deadlines and and being on time. It's very important. <laughs> Yes, always turn your homework in on time. <laughs> something, something to be um, said about being early. Um, I Because Los Angeles, there's a long commute for everything. I was a librarian at Star Trek Into Darkness. And I just showed up very early because I like to be calm and I don't like to be stressed. And I ended up just being an hour and a half early for the recording session. And everybody else was late. And the composer said, hey, um, you know, where's this person? Where's this person? And they couldn't find him. And they're like, oh, hey, you, can you orchestrate this? I said, sure. And I was just sitting there drink, eat, drinking my coffee and I'm like this and I, that's how I ended up orchestrating on Star Trek Into Darkness. It was cause I just showed up an hour and a half early. Um, so I'm a big proponent in being, being on time or being early. And if you're 10 minutes or 10 minutes early then you're already too late. <laughs> mm-hmm. That brings up a really good uh, question. Um, that's a great example, Susie, of something surprise, a very happy surprise that happened. You obviously were early, which allowed that to happen, um, but nonetheless, a, a very happy surprise. Uh, Sarah and Rico, have either you experienced kind of something like that where very happy, pleasant surprise came out and you found yourself having a whole new opportunity in your career that you wouldn't have had otherwise? Hmm. Enrico, <laughs> go. Yeah. Uh, go. Well, I mean, my, my entire career right now is kind of based on an, a happy surprise in that, you know, like I said, at first I wanted to be an opera conductor and then I got to Omaha and discovered, oh, symphonic music. It's great. I love working with the symphony orchestra just in that sense. And then similarly, I got here to Nashville as their assistant conductor first and then later on was offered the principal pops job where because you know they they liked the kind of work I was already doing in the pop shows and movies that I was doing here and that was sort of not a career path I had ever expected to be taking but it played off of all the things I loved growing up whether it was being in rock bands or you know listening to hip-hop or play, you know all the genres that I enjoyed growing up so that was sort of a surprise and now at every turn, it's like another surprise. It's like, oh my gosh, I get to conduct the movies I loved growing up watching on TV or in movie theaters, or you know, I'll I'll get a last minute phone call of like someone got sick. Can you come conduct the Beach Boys? And like my mom loved the Beach Boys growing up, and so I was like, 
yeah, hopping on a plane, just have the scores there for me when I get there. Kind of, you know, it's just kind of the fast paced world that we as conductors live in, especially on the pops and movie side, I'd say more than anything else, because for the most part, the, the shows we do have very little rehearsal time, have very little prep time. And it's just like, throw it together really fast, be very efficient and then go. So you kind of never know. And the surprises are almost endless. <laughs> Absolutely. Sarah, did you have anything particular that kind of um, that came I guess to mind? I did. Sure. Uh, 10 years ago, I was doing a concert with the jazz trumpeter Chris Bodie, um, who's a, the protege of Sting. And we got along. So I invited him out to dinner and we got to talking and knowing each other more. And we had a great time working together. In the middle of the dinner, Chris said, hey, do you like the music of Sting? And I said, I sure do. And he said, can I recommend you to go on tour with him? I was like, absolutely. Um, and that was surprising. But my takeaway was invite people to dinner, first of all. Um, but second of all, networking is everything in the music world, in conducting, and but even in the rest of the world. Uh, the connections that you make lead to your next job, to your next, rela ne next relationship, to your next opportunity. So really treat the people around you kindly and think of them as, as resources and a resource for people when you can, because that's how things get done. Absolutely. And I can, I can personally attest to that too. Uh, I would say, be a good person to work with, do hard work, do your homework on time and be a pleasant individual. That'll get you a long ways. Um, that's how I got my job at Disney was through a, through a connection of somebody I was working with. And when they knew they needed somebody with this particular skill set, um, this person said, well, I know who you need to call. And I, I was fortunate enough, like a lot of you, to find myself in that situation. Um, Sam, thank you so much for your question about the difference between orchestrating um, and arranging. Um, Susie, I guess if you want, obviously, in, a, in addition to your great uh, response there, really quickly kind of break down composing, arranging, orchestrating, um, kind of those three differences for the kids. Um, there's differences, but there's also a lot of overlap as well. Um, composing is, is a blank slate usually where you have, you have very little to work on and it's usually just completely created in your head. Um, arrangement, arranging can be something that you can arrange, say, um, a song like, uh, something from Encanto and then let's say, oh, can we make this like a big band version of it? Um, and take the style away completely and put it in a different setting. Um, so there's a lot of composing involved in arranging too, but you still have to really keep up with the identity of the original composition. And then orchestrating um, is almost always focused on what the composer intended. Um, and that always has to be final because Arranging doesn't always have to be final. Usually I am still orchestrating somebody else's arrangement because it's not complete. Um, and so an orchestration has to be a final score um, that is complete and can be ready to be copied to its own, um, to its own individual parts. And so orchestrating actually is like deciding what the first violin is gonna play, what the trumpet is gonna play, right? Yes, and usually um, when things are written, especially on the computer, um, everything is like a big blur, like all the winds must do this and all the strings must do this. And then I have to like look and go, oh, these are out of range of these instruments. So, and this line's not going to work. And oh, this is going to sound horrible on the oboe because it's too low. So you have to think about all those things. I don't know how to play all those instruments. I just know sort of the details and, and how it sounds in my head. And it's very clear to me. And so I understand that this is gonna sound better on this instrument. And so you eventually just have to make it sparkle at the end. Or cool. you know, I, I worked on horror movies. So sometimes working on horror movies is fun because you have to go to the extremes where you make the instrument sound horrible. And that's a lot of fun too. <laughs> knowing yeah just where to put it just right so it can hit the audience just like you want it to yeah absolutely um so something i think that's really great about the school where everyone goes to here the neighborhood music school is 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 the neighborhood that surrounds the community um enrico 
can you kind of talk the kids just a little bit and recommend like how how to really go out and discover the music that is in their neighborhood in their community and just really accessing that and immersing yourself in what what's right outside your door yeah i mean especially the part of town and the city that you all are living in you're so lucky that there's music everywhere i mean from obviously a great symphony orchestra to just local community groups um there are obviously all the time concerts in the area at different theaters around town. There are, you know, free public things uh, at, you know, the Mariachi Plaza that happened. I remember going to watch all the time when I lived in LA and there's just all these endless opportunities. And if you play an instrument, which, or sing, which you all do, obviously, uh, there are a lot of opportunities to make friends through that kind of thing. There are places where you can you know, sometimes it requires you to audition or not. But I mean, for me, music is what got me some of my best friends now to this day, people that I met when I was in elementary school, middle school, high school, and we played in groups together. And it may have been the school wind ensemble or the, you know, San Diego Youth Symphony, or it may have been just forming a rock band like Sarah and I did. And that's where I've made some of my lifelong friends is through music, through the different kind of opportunities to play in different areas, meet different people, but you always have that common interest with those people, which is music. And then from there, your friendship can kind of grow into other cool ways. That's amazing. No, you're absolutely right. Music really does form lifelong bonds between people, um, friendships, and that will transcend everything, which I think is pretty special. Um, so I think as part of our wrap up here, because we are approaching five minutes left, hour has flown by. Um, Kind of, kind of break this down into two parts is kind of the the final thoughts from each of you. So the first one being, um, what is some advice that you would give to the students that are looking to want to be conductors? And then kind of going back to the general theme of this this careers in music, because each of you are so versatile and do so many amazing things. You know what what advice you give to the students um, as they look at and think about doing uh, a career in music. They don't know what they quite want to do yet, but they want music to be part of their professional work life. Um, so as a recap to the conductors, our young conductors in the room advice, and then those who want to have music as a part of their profession going forward, um, or once they get there, of course, some of them are a few years away. Um, Sarah, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, as a conductor, learn all the instruments, even if you don't play them, know how they create sound, know how they sound and how they sound together. Uh, study all kinds of music. It's really important. And if you can get in front of a bunch of people, it could be three people singing for you. It could be a piano. It could be five trumpets. It doesn't matter. Practice the craft and see how it feels and what you can learn that way, because I think conducting is really hands on. And if you got friends, you can you can have a, a group of people to work for um, that who will work for you. Um, and just, you know, breaking into music, there's so many different ways. Uh, when I started 20 years ago, I think it's very different than it is now. People are much more entrepreneurial. There are opportunities on social media to start your careers. Um, be creative and reach out to people who inspire you um, because most people want to help other musicians. So don't be afraid to ask and to and to find a mentor for yourself. Excellent. Uh, Enrico? I'd say my advice is the same for both, whether you're trying to become a musician in general or a conductor specifically, it's learn about as many things as you can and just be involved in as many things as you can because being a good conductor or a good musician just means being very well-rounded and knowing about a lot of stuff. and. If that means being good at public speaking, that's going to help you. If it means learning about, you know, psychology or learning about how to be a good cook and the creativity that's involved in cooking, all of those things are going to make you a more well-rounded person. And when it comes to making music, whether that's holding a stick or holding an instrument, you're going to be better at it because you're going to have more life experience and you're going to have more things to draw from for inspiration for you know energy and creativity so the more things you can do and the more you can get out there pursuing your hobbies and learning about them i think that's going to help you in any any realm of music and if you're not going to pursue music professionally 
being involved in music is going to help you in whatever profession you do go on to study because the creativity and the types of skills that you're developing learning music are going to help you if you want to be a lawyer if you want to be a doctor if you want it doesn't matter it's going to help you in all those areas awesome and susie uh, bring us home <laughs> sure um you know i i'm i'm really lucky that i get to work with people that are geniuses and i will say i am not a genius I am not even particularly gifted. I am just incredibly persistent and I'm not afraid to fail. Um, and I fail all the time and I make mistakes and I just learn from them. Um, and I think that people that are young are really afraid to fail or make mistakes and that prevents people from taking chances and, and making you know steps in their lives. And I will just say, I fail all the time and I just learn from it and I listen to myself and then I do things differently um, because I'm not particularly gifted. Um, I, there were, I, just, I struggle a lot with things, especially with music, um, but I am just incredibly persistent and I try really hard. So do not be afraid to fail. If you don't try, it will never happen, so. Very good. Well, uh, Enrico, Sarah, Susie, thank you so very much for joining me on this third third round of these this special talks for music careers for our friends at Neighborhood Music School. Um, everyone out there listening, thank you so much for being a great audience. Thank you for giving us questions beforehand and then some questions in our chat. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Karen. I would love if our Neighborhood Music School kids could drop in the chat just a few words that really um, excited them today. Um, what did you hear that made you, I know we had one student who said, hey, wait, I play trumpet. Can you put a word or two um, just in the chat right now to let our hosts know what you heard come from them today? I heard a lot of investment. I heard a lot of love. Um, I'm going to start with that. If everyone could just throw a chat in there. Thank you, Rachel. I see some hearts, pianos. You guys, your perspective um, means so much to us, you know, especially in these past two years that have been so hard. We here are, you know, that that musical family and being able to reach out and learn more about the tools that we're learning now and how they can affect us later on down the line is so important to us. So thank you so much for spending this time with us today. And um, I hope we'll see you again soon at the house. Absolutely.